your water. Um, we're going to have one more proposition, one more debate, and then we're going to break for lunch. So I'd appreciate it if, if uh, people, if they can, stay in their seats. Um, Professor Zhao, you can come up here, and Professor Friedberg. Our next proposition is China seeks to undermine the rules-based international system. And of course, this morning we heard uh, in uh, Professor Christensen's and Professor Jia Daojung's remarks uh, some uh, discussion already of the issue of whether or not China is undermining or seeking to undermine the rules-based uh, system. But it's a critical question for the international community as to what China's emergence on the global stage means for the international system. Under Xi Jinping's rule, China is seeking to play a bigger role in global governance. But the ways and the extent to which Beijing wants to adjust the international system um, are uncertain. And as I discussed earlier, uh, China has arguably gained um, a great deal, perhaps the most from the existing rules-based international uh, liberal international order, uh, probably more so than all developing countries. Market openness has fueled a surge in Chinese trade with the rest of the world, and China is the world's largest producer of manufactured goods today. The global non-proliferation regime has also served Chinese interest. We talked this morning about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is a visible sign of China's ambition to play a greater role in rule setting for international lending. The renminbi's inclusion in the IMF special drawing rights is another sign of Beijing's ambition to shape the international system. But to what end? To strengthen the prevailing rules-based order or to radically alter it? So debating what China's transformation into a global power means for the international order, um, we have two terrific speakers. And while I introduce them, I'm going to ask you all to start voting on the proposition. Will, if you can put up our proposition there. Thank you very much. So again, to my right, uh, Professor Aaron Friedberg, who is a professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University, former deputy national security advisor to former Vice President Dick Cheney. And to my left, uh, Professor Zhao Sui Sheng, Sam Zhao, uh, who is professor of the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver and director of its Center for China-US Cooperation. Uh, both speakers have written on this topic, and I think it's critically important uh, uh, issue that we uh, are discussing here and very pleased that they are both here uh, to debate this question today. So before I let them give their remarks, we're going to see what the results are of the voting. Will? Okay, so we have 42% that agree with the proposition that China seeks to undermine the rules-based international system, and 57% who disagree. Okay. And we will see if our debaters can change your minds. <laughs> OK, I think we are starting with, uh, with you. Aaron, please. Bonnie, well, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate the invitation to participate in this event. I think we've all learned uh, not to trust public opinion polls, so I'm not sure <laughs> quite how much This uh, is elite polling. It's uh, not elite just polling. public opinion. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I've been asked to <clears throat> defend the proposition that China seeks to undermine the rule-based international system. And I will do my best. Uh, but first, I'm going to do something which I always advise my students not to do, which is to quibble with the question. Uh, and I hope that Bonnie will forgive me for this. Uh, but I was reminded of the perhaps apocryphal exam question. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Discuss. Um, and. I, I think there are questions that need to be raised about the terminology of the question. And Admiral Blair actually did something similar in his opening, so I think I have some cover. Uh, what do we mean by China? Uh, what do we mean by the rule-based international system? And what do we mean by undermine? Let me take the first, uh, as the first one, the most difficult. 
uh, what do we mean by a rules-based international system? Uh, and this term is often used interchangeably with liberal international system or order, which in my view is actually something quite specific and rather different. Uh, that would be a system comprised of liberal democratic nation states that were linked together by trade, by international institutions, and by a shared commitment to certain universal values, democracy, uh, equality, human rights, and so on. Uh, just as an historical note, uh, since the emergence of the United States onto the world stage as a major power, when uh, forced to choose its objectives, the United States has repeatedly sought, in fact, to create this kind of international order. This is what Woodrow Wilson tried to do unsuccessfully after World War I. After World War II, uh, having abandoned brief illusory hope uh, that this kind of system could be created on a global scale, the United States and its allies settled for a partial liberal order, uh, which generally referred to, or what came to be referred to as the West, although it included uh, states in Asia as well, the United States, North, North American uh, countries, uh, US European allies, and also over time an increasing number of democracies in East Asia. So there was a liberal international order after World War II, but it was not a global order. In the wake of the Cold War, US policymakers hoped that they could expand the boundaries of this liberal democratic order to make it truly global, to incorporate Russia, to incorporate uh, the former Soviet republics, to incorporate the countries of Eastern Europe that had been under Soviet domination, and also to accelerate uh, and to deepen China's integration into the global economy and into international institutions. And that was the direction of US policy, starting with the George H.W. Bush administration and continuing particularly in the Clinton administration and down to the present. And the expectation, at least at the outset, was that these states were or soon would be liberal democracies. And of course, this hasn't happened. Russia and China have been partially integrated into the Western liberal order and Russia is now partially excluded because of its behavior. Uh, these countries, particularly China, grew richer and stronger, but they have not yet been transformed. The character of their political regimes remains as it was. In fact, to the contrary, both Russia and China have become more repressive and more assertive or aggressive in their external behavior. So the, the gamble, the hope, uh, that was the basis of US policy at the end of the Cold War has not been borne out by events. What we have now is not a rules-based international system, but rather an international system in which there are a variety of rules, regimes, and institutions, and norms, uh, and in which some forms of interaction among states can be described as rule-based, but in which there is also still an ongoing struggle for power and influence, uh, contention about values, boundaries, hierarchies of prestige, and about what the rules should be. And if we focus only on the domains that are or could be described uh, as functioning under agreed rules, we risk missing the forest for the trees. So the other two possible quibbles are easier to dispense with. Uh, when I use the term China, I'm referring to the Chinese Communist Party and the apparatus of the Chinese party state. And this is an important distinction, I think, because China's external behavior and its internal behavior as well, in my view, reflect primarily the interests and concerns of the party. And finally, what do we mean by underline, undermine? Uh, if this term is taken to mean to transform or to overthrow, then I think it's not an accurate description of what China seeks, at least not yet. China is not, in my view, a revolutionary power, but uh, hopeful statements to the contrary notwithstanding, it's become increasingly clear, I think, in the last few years that it is also not a status quo power. It's not content with every aspect of the existing order. So I think China can best be understood as a revisionist state. It seeks to change some important aspects of the existing international system, including uh, some of the rules, the regimes, and institutions that that system currently contains, and, and this is an important additional point, it seeks to do so in ways that are, at least in some respects, uh, counter to the interests and values of the United States, at least 
as those have been defined over the last 75 years. China's rulers uh, are motivated by a mix of ambition and insecurity. Uh, and both of these sensations or feelings, uh, inclinations, I think, uh, were significantly heightened by the events of the last decade, especially the global financial crisis, which both increased, I think, Chinese confidence that uh, its power was on the rise and the power of the United States was on decline, in the decline, but also increased anxiety about the ability of uh, China's current growth model, the ability of the system to maintain growth, and the prospects for future growth and political stability. And I think that mix of uh, ambition and insecurity, it's not new, but both have grown more intense. Regarding many aspects of the current international system broadly uh, defined, including, then, but not limited to, some of these regimes and institutions and rules, uh, China's leaders consider them to be uh, in large part unfair, illegitimate, and potentially threatening to CCP rule. And not surprising that this should be so, uh, because the key elements of that system were put in place when China was relatively weak uh, and when it was relatively isolated, and from the point of view of Chinese uh, leaders, not uh, surprisingly, uh, they regard many of these arrangements as uh, unfair to them and say now with increasing openness that some of them need to change. Broadly speaking, I think uh, China's rulers have three goals uh, which are embodied in Xi Jinping's uh, China dream, this idea of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. First and foremost, to preserve CCP rule, to preserve the monopoly on political power of the Chinese Communist Party. I think in many senses, that's the beginning and end uh, of much of their thinking about what needs to be done in every domain. So that's job one. Number two, uh, I think that they uh, intend to establish or would like to establish, or as they would see it, to reestablish China as the preponderant power in Eastern Eurasia. There may be debates about what exactly that means or how to do it or what the timeline is, but uh, I do think this is a position to which they believe China is entitled because of its history and also because of its renewed and still growing power, but also a position that they regard as necessary for reasons that Admiral Blair has suggested uh, in order to reduce threats to the nation's interests and to regime survival that are post posed by hostile powers on China's periphery and, of course, first and foremost, the United States. Third and finally, and I think this has started to kind of emerge in some of the discussion about where China is going, something that Chinese leaders in the past have forsworn, but which today I think they uh, accept as a reasonable goal, and that is ultimately to establish China as a power on par with the United States, a global, truly global power, second to none. So how to get there from here? Well, two caveats. Uh, I don't think that there is a sort of fully developed master plan that's hidden away in a safe somewhere. Uh, this is a work in progress, especially as regards the longer term goals. And second, uh, I should add that even if there is a strategy, and I believe there is, and certainly it's become clearer in the, in the shorter term, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to succeed. You can have strategies that don't work, and this one may not. Although uh, Chinese theorists and strategists and policymakers have begun to think and talk about how they might seek to change aspects of the wider global system, for now, as in the past, I think they're still heavily focused on their own region, the 360 degrees around China. We tend to focus on the maritime domain because we're a maritime power in the Pacific, but of course China also has this long continental periphery, which historically has been even more important to it. Regarding the global system, China seeks, for the most part, to, uh, to preserve some important elements of that system, which it believes function to its benefit, although um, it does so as a result of calculations of interest rather than any commitment in principle uh, to those elements of the regime. For example, uh, China is, as we've heard, uh, in some respects now the leading advocate of traditional norms of sovereignty non-interference, uh, although I think 
uh, this may start to change as China develops far-flung interests of its own that may at some point be seen as China's leaders as requiring intervention in the affairs of others. But for the moment, China is the true believer in the kind of Westphalian notion of, sort of hard sovereignty. Uh, China supports the UN system, which it sees uh, as a useful break or regulator on the actions of others, especially the United States. China is, as some have pointed out, uh, seeking a greater role, uh, for example, in peacekeeping operations, uh, although it might, uh, I think it probably would, use whatever additional leverage uh, this might provide to shift the orientation of such missions uh, away from those that might be justified on the principle of responsibility to protect, which China rejects, uh, and towards those that would help protect and advance its own interests. A Chinese security official uh, was recently named the head of Interpol. Uh, I don't think this is too surprising. Beijing has been trying to increase its reach uh, in order to go after those it accuses of corruption and subversion on an international scale. Uh, the World Trade Organization, the global trading system, China has, as Bonnie suggests, benefited enormously from this system. Uh, and if others, including the United States, now seem to be backing away from it, China will, not surprisingly, present itself as the leading defender of that system. However, it should also be said uh, that it seems increasingly clear that China has been systematically violating the spirit, if not always the letter, of the WTO and using uh, its procedures to protect itself from retaliation by advanced industrial economies. And this has worked pretty well, so why should they want it to change? The Non-Proliferation Treaty has been mentioned in the regime, and although China uh, has significant responsibility for many of the proliferation problems that the world currently faces, it now does support the NPT, uh, although it's been reluctant to bring to bear all of the potential leverage that it has, for example, to deal with the problem of North Korea. One area, sort of global system, where China does seek change uh, is in the governance of the Internet where it has now been trying to establish the principle of internet sovereignty under which governments would have the right to control information flows within their own borders. Another aspect of the current global system that I think China rejects in, in theory, in principle, or simply ignores are the various international covenants regarding human rights, to which it's a signatory. But it's at the regional level uh, that China's revision, revisionism is more clear-cut. Uh, China has, of course, long-standing territorial claims remaining in the region, first and foremost perhaps to Taiwan, but also to these maritime features that we've been discussing, and as has been uh, already described, it's been more forcefully pursuing uh, its claims in the maritime domain. Regarding that domain more broadly, I mean, aside from whatever pieces of rock may be out there, uh, as uh, Tom and others have described, China has its own unique interpretation of the UN law of the sea, uh, and if it's able to enforce its claims, Beijing will be able to exercise effective control over much of the water and airspace inside the First Island chain. Regarding the balance of military power in the region, Admiral McDevitt has described this at length. I won't, I won't uh, repeat what he said, but through its exertions, China has succeeded in shifting the balance of military power in East Asia in its favor and away from the United States. Regarding U.S. alliances and forward-based forces, uh, China has, as, as Admiral uh, Blair, I think, uh, mentioned, long described these as relics of the Cold War that should fade away in time. But uh, in recent years, it's also stepped up the rhetorical temperature a bit, and the United States and its alliances are now described as an actively destabilizing influence in the region. China's been using its uh, economic weight, I think, to try to weaken uh, U.S. ties with some of its traditional allies, albeit, I think we're going to hear more about this in the next panel, with mixed results to date. Uh, it seems to be doing pretty well in the Philippines. Uh, Thailand is working, I think, trying to work on Australia, has in the past tried to use uh, economic leverage or the threat of the use of economic leverage to influence policy in South Korea, not very successfully to date. Uh, China has been attempting to create new trading arrangements that would further strengthen its ties uh, to others in the region, and I think, if possible, to marginalize the United States. That's whatever its economic purposes. I think the RCEP has a strategic rationale, just as the TPP had one. Uh, it's building new financial institutions 
uh, that would bypass or limit the influence of Western-led institutions, banks that can make loans without the conditions regarding transparency and corruption and governance that the existing institutions uh, impose. Uh, it's also working to create new mechanisms to facilitate financial transactions. Uh, the China International Payment System, which some have described as a possible alternative to the SWIFT system, which could reduce the vulnerability of China and others who made use of it to financial sanctions that could be imposed by the West. Infrastructure, we've touched briefly on the One Belt, One Road, which is an enormously ambitious uh, set of proposed projects, which if successful, would increase connectivity and enhance China's influence across much of Eurasia, all the way into South Asia, the Persian Gulf, and all the way to Western Europe. Uh, this would be, if it's possible to construct it, a system in which all roads, figuratively, if not literally, would lead to Beijing. Finally, regarding multilateral regional political institutions, uh, China has, I think, effectively divided and weakened ASEAN, and it's just beginning to take steps to strengthen some new institutions that could enhance coordination among like-minded Eurasian regimes regarding how to deal with terrorism, but also how to deal with dissidents, how to maintain control over the internet, and so on. So to conclude, what's the vision that underlies all of this activity? When the United States emerged onto the global stage at the turn of the 20th century, it sought to, as Woodrow Wilson said, make the world safe for democracy. Uh, China's rulers, I think, want to make the world safe for one-party authoritarianism, or at least to make Eurasia safe for continued CCP rule. And, although this is speculation, what they appear to have in mind is what might be described as a kind of nested regional order, connected to, but also insulated from, the global and still largely liberal Western international order a grouping of like-minded states, again, mostly authoritarian, in which China would clearly be the dominant power that would be linked together by trade, finance, uh, physical and information infrastructure, and also a shared commitment to preserve their preferred form of rule. And this system might have, or ideally would have, semi-permeable physical and virtual boundaries. The countries within it, China first and foremost, would be able to export what they wanted, and to reach into the more open societies of the West to influence their attitudes and policies, it would be able to import what it needs from outside that system, but it would also have the capacity to restrict flows of goods, people, ideas, and information that might be seen as harmful or threatening. And that, if it is what comes to pass, would be a very different world than the one we live in now, and certainly different than the one uh, we thought we were headed towards 25 years ago. Thank you. So, Professor Friedberg has argued to us at least the Chinese Communist Party is a revisionist power in its approach to the prevailing international system. So we'll have to see if there's some overlap or distinction or greater difference uh, with uh, Professor Sam Zhao. So over to you. Okay, thank you, Bonnie, for, first of all, for having me here and uh, congratulations for assembling uh, such a big crowd here showing how successful your program is. And uh, talking about debate on the issue, in fact, I uh, also assigned my students uh, those debate uh, classes. I always told my students to be opinionated and uh, you don't have to believe what you talk about, but you have to take a strong position. Here, what I'm happy is that I happen to believe what I'm going to talk about, and uh, I try to be modest because we already got over 50% to support the position. And talking about position, uh, Professor uh, uh, Fredberg mentioned that uh, the internet system, which I agree largely, but I don't think it's a, a complete reflection of the current internal system. Talking about internal system is talking about distribution of power. And the talking about roles, norms, which I think has been built after World War II based on mixture 
of transnational norms of it globalization and the one failure principles of state sovereignty. These are two very different types, power politics versus liberal orders. And uh, these have been supported by three institutional arrangements. First is multilateral economic institutions. When finding the, the uh, printing world system, World Bank, IMF, and the WTO, these types, to facilitate uh, the free movements of capitals and uh, trade goods. The second is a uh, uh, connective security system of uh, concert powers, which try to restrict the threat or use of force. Third is what uh, Professor Frankman mentioned most about uh, the, the promotion of self-determination, including those democratic governments. Uh, to be a dominant position. So talking about these three institutional arrangements and uh, international uh, norms, China was a revolutionary power for sure before China entered the UN in 1971 because China was a target of the uh, US containment and also was not a member of that system. China tried to overthrow that system for sure. China has, I agree with uh, Professor Frank, Frank mentioned that China has become a revisionist power uh, ever since. In fact, China started when they entered the UN system trying to be a free rider. From that perspective, China even became somehow a status quo power, especially in those uh, multiple multilateral economic institutions. China became the largest beneficiary of WTO, um, World Bank, and the IMF, and had tried very hard, in my mind, uh, to adapt to those trans transnational norms. And China also became a major contributor to the UN budget, and uh, even became a peacekeeping uh, operation uh, contributor. That reflected China's power position in the international system, because China was weak, China worried about erosion of sovereignty. When China became more powerful, China became less worried about the sovereignty issue because China could use its power to protect its sovereignty. So in that context, I would argue that China became a more nice status quo power and also to a great extent a reformist power eventually. Why China has transformed from status quo free rider to a revisionist or reformist power? Because uh, China is beneficiary to the system, but China is not satisfied with its position in the international system. It's not China is opposing, trying to undermine the rules and norms. If China is not happy, it's uneasy with its current status in the international system. Why? Let me give you three causes why China is not happy. First, most of those rules and norms were set up when China was not on the table after World War II. And uh, China failed, at least for quite a while, disadvantaged. And uh, uh, in the international rule-making games, it's better than those so-called liberal norms, human rights on those issues. China has a very different political system. And China has a lot of different views about those uh, liberal issues. So China is worried that the US would use its dominant position to promote those values to undermine China's positions, China regime even, that's the concern China has. Second, uh, when those rules, the UN system was built, US had a very predominant position. I mean, almost 50% of the global GDP. But what is the US position today? Less than 30%, maybe only 25%. When this system was created, China was only 2% of the global GDP. What is China's place today? 
15%, almost to the 20%, closing to the U.S. position. So the rules made when U.S. was dominant, in that kind of predominant position, China was in that kind of weak position, should be changed. When China becomes 20, 15%, 20% of GDP, China should have the commemorate voice and participation, representation on the table, which China does not feel. China has that kind of representation and the voices. The US, from Chinese perspective, I'm not Chinese, now I'm American citizen, although, although I came from China, but the <laughs> 31 years ago, 31 years in China, I was born in China, 31 years in the US, so half, half. 62 years old. <laughs> so, uh, from the Chinese perspective, you can talk to Chinese colleagues. They were very kind of unhappy about these kind of positions. U.S. is not encouraging the U.S. assist China to rise to be part of the system, but U.S. is not welcome China to become contender to the system to appear power. I mean, TPP now. Trump is going to abandon that. But Obama argued TPP, if we don't make those roles, China would make those roles. When China makes those roles, we will be disadvantaged. Is that a zero-sum game? That's a mentality from Chinese perspective. China is not welcomed to be on the rule-making table. Third. U.S. has played such important role to making those rules, but U.S. does not follow those rules itself. U.S. has double standard. No country, I mean, talking to Chinese colleagues, they always complain that no country in the world has made more efforts than the U.S. to make those rules, to bind others. But no country, a very few countries in the world has like the U.S. tried to avoid following those rules itself. I mean, the concept of power, the connective security system, U.S. entered COSFO in, in 99 without U.N. Security Council approval. U.N. invaded Iraq with a coalition, coalition of weedings, not U.N. Security Council uh, authorization either. So U.S. itself has a breaker of the international rules and norms U.S. has tried to establish. So why China, in that case, should be judged in a different standard from Chinese perspective? So in that context, I agree with Professor Freiberg that China has become revisionist power. But I have, I have word, I have to use another term to get the slash, revision power, reformist power. China tried to reform the system, not only revise, not, not undermine the system, but try to revise, try to reform this system. China is not in a position to undermine the system because the following uh, causes. First, China is not in the position that the U.S. was 45, 50, I mean, half a century ago when the U.S. helped or led the creation of the post-World War II system. U.S. was in the predominant position. China does not have the capacity yet. Second, China does not have the followers the U.S. had after World War II. China does not have the trust of the world U.S. earned after the World War II. I mean, talking to Chinese leaders, they all have to agree, admit that China is far, far from the position U.S. was. China, I mean, talking about rising powers, the bandwagoner, bandwagoning behavior is typical because benefit to bandwagon with the rising powers, but China does not have those kind of followers, even does not have those trust among its neighbors, creates so many problems. How could China, in that case, to lead creation of separate system? Third, 
soft power. The U.S. power is not only a hot, hot power military level forces, it's the influence. Soft power, China does not have that. Talking about roles, what kind of distinctive values and roles China could propose to replace the U.S. net roles, norms, all on the heaven, Tianxia system? Nobody would accept that. Maybe only Chinese themselves. I mean, the neighbors will not accept that. Communist values? I don't think so. I don't think China is a communist country at all now. More capitalistic than many capitalist countries. Then what they have left is Western Fadian principles, which is not Chinese. It's European system. Even during the Cold War, China tried to re un undermine the UN system. The, the values they proposed was the five principles of coexistence, which was the Western Fadian principles, not the Chinese principles. It's, the, it's one of the fundamental principles of the current international system. So I don't think China can find anything as alternatives to the current international system of values. False. China has so many problems. Domestically, people talking about domestic issues. Talking to Xi Jinping, he worries more about unrest, his rivals, or worry more about the United States, worry more about Japan. I don't think that's what in the top priority of the Chinese leaders. China's problems are not from the international system. It's from domestic system, domestic economic slowdown, all those problems. So in summary, I will say I agree with Professor Frankberg that China is not a status quo power, but I don't think China is in a position to undermine the current international system. Thank you. Okay, revisionist versus reform. Uh, before I, we go to voting, I'm going to allow uh, all of you to ask a few questions. If you can link it to the debate in some way, that would be great. <laughs> so that we can sharpen some of these points before we do our final voting. Okay, we have a question back there. Raise your hand so she can see where the microphone is going. Thank you. Thank you for this very hard debate. I'm sure that a lot of audience has heard some unwelcome uh, voices, but I'm trying to find a compromise. Uh, I'm Wen Chen Huang, uh, coming from Taiwan. Uh, for security issues, uh, I think most people still believe that power politics works more than rule-based international systems. But for economic issues, I tend to believe that there will more and more cooperation between both sides. And even within the economic issues, still, we have some exception rules for both great powers, such as United States and China, to have the de facto devoting powers within the WTO is true. So there's no difference for US or the China to manipulate or influence the decision of the WTO. Both are the same. So I don't see there's a, very, there's a lot of contradiction between both sides. Thank you. OK, you want to be a spoiler of my debate uh, set up here, but it's OK. <laughs> so I appreciate your view. Gil Rosman, over here. I was surprised, Gil Rosman, the Asan Forum. I was surprised by the lack of uh, mention of Russia and Sino Russian relations and the effort, maybe now with Russia getting uh, a certain boost by various elections that seem to be 
giving it uh, more leverage in the world. Uh, Russia and China um, increasing their effort to try to establish the SCO and other organizations as a basis for altering, revising the rules-based order. What do you see as a prospect of that relationship? Okay, um, question over here. Hello, I'm Pass. I'm from one of the small countries in the area, the, the Kingdom of Thailand. And um, I have a question about Chinese influence for Professor Jia. You said that China does not have the same influence that the U.S. has, but from what I understand, like certain ASEAN countries, such as Laos, they're basically a Chinese puppet state. And, and um, even in my country, like there's a lot of Chinese influence. Like we deported some Uyghurs back to the mainland. So if you can answer about that. Thank you. Interesting question. Okay, we have time for one more. Devin in the back over here. Devin Ellis. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, Devin Ellis from the University of Maryland. This, either late last week or early this week, Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan indicated that if the EU doesn't move more quickly with the session talks, he would be happy to join the SCO instead. I wonder if each of the panelists might comment on the significance of that type of uh, incident comment development and what it, how you might interpret it from the perspective you've each taken on the question. Okay, um, Aaron, you want to start? And feel free to take on each other's points if okay. you would like to rebut anything that, right. uh, that Sam has said. Uh, let me try to give uh, brief answers to some of the questions that were, that were raised. Um, uh, my old friend and colleague, Professor Rosman, uh, what about Russia? Very important issue. Uh, and I, I do think that uh, although the outcome is as yet unclear and there are many sources of potential tension and disagreement and mistrust between Russia and China, certainly in recent years, in part because of the reactions of the West to Russian behavior on the one hand and Chinese behavior on the other, these two countries have been pressed closer together. Uh, some of what the Chinese have in mind with One Belt, One Road would involve uh, Russia. Um, I also think that there is, at the moment, a commonality of values in a kind of negative sense. It's not that these two countries are joined together by an agreed ideology as they were at least briefly during the Cold War, and of course they were divided by the same ideology, uh, but they know what they don't like. And what they don't like is Western intrusion, uh, efforts by the United States and others and na uh, non-governmental organizations as they see it to undermine their rule. And so there's a, ba a serious basis for cooperation. I think if this vision that I suggested of a kind of Eurasian authoritarian order were to come to pass, Russia would play a significant role in it. Uh, and just to go to the question of Turkey, um, there too, uh, I think, given the direction of political events in that country, uh, we may find that some further to the West uh, are eager to participate in a system which is uh, consists of countries that don't criticize it for its internal behavior uh, and which may offer it options uh, to improve its economic situation and maybe its security standing without that kind of baggage and pressure attached. Uh, and I certainly think the Chinese would be uh, interested in that possibility. They're very open uh, to cooperating, uh, not just with authoritarian regimes, but they're much happier with those. Uh, in terms of Russia, I agree also with uh, Professor Frankberg mentioned that uh, China and Russia have uh, worked together to oppose the U.S. Uh, uh, dominance and uh, U.S. Uh, from their perspective uh, pressures on these two countries. Uh, but I don't think China could uh, agree with Russia what they are for. They uh, work together against the U.S., but not try to produce or create some new norms, new systems. In fact, uh, I think there's a lot of suspicions between Russia and China on both sides. In fact, uh, uh, last week, when President Putin uh, answered uh, in, in that news program, talking about the child asked him, where's the Russia border? He said the Russia border is uh, unlimited. 
that will pick it up right away, right away by the Chinese uh, media. I read that, I was, oh, oh, wow. See, Chinese are so sensitive to this type of uh, uh, talks because the historically these two countries really had so many problems. So I don't think they can work together to undermine or overthrow, overtake the international order in our system. In terms of the Chinese influence in South Asia and uh, also Africa, some other places, I think those uh, influences are very different from the US influences. US provided um, values for many countries to follow. US provided security, stability on this region. China, those influence came from what? Money. Money. They bought Cambodia. They bought laws. I mean, talking to Chinese colleagues, many people, we can just go in, use money to balance. I mean, everything's just, just like in the Chinese domestic politics. They can buy everything. That's what I found amazing. Their influence come not from those soft power, not quite from, I think China have realized that importance of the soft power, public diplomacy, talking to those people, they have tried to do a lot of things on those front. But I have not seen those very successful long-term influence in those areas yet. I mean, even in the Philippine cases, I don't know how long that person could be a friend of China in the next 10 years or so. <laughs> He'll only be there for five. <laughs> I just wanted to add a, a few more thoughts on this because I think it's such an important and interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure whether money buying influences soft power or hard power. You know, we said money talks yeah. as long Nobody as you walks. have it. Uh, and uh, China has it at the moment and is, and is spreading it around liberally. Uh, just a few further thoughts about the commonality of interest or strategic perspective between Russia and China. Uh, hinted at earlier in one of the questions, I think both of them have an interest in, if they can, weakening and dividing the Western liberal democratic countries and weakening them from within to the extent they can. Uh, Russia seems to be more uh, using more blunt but perhaps successful instruments in trying to do that, not only uh, in our electoral process but also in Europe, supporting uh, political parties that are to the, to the right and favor uh, the weakening of existing uh, multinational institutions in Europe. China, too, would prefer to deal with individual players uh, in Europe and in Asia rather than with strong and united uh, allies and, and multinational institutions. So these two uh, are, I think, as they see it, operating from a position of relative weakness, more Russia than China, uh, but still China for the time being. Uh, but they believe that they can offset that in part by weakening and dividing the West. Let me add one sentence on this. Um, if Trump, um, Trump has been somehow supported, if that's the argument there by the Russians' uh, uh, forces, and uh, if he tries to improve the relationships with Russia, I think China will be in a very defensive position. And uh, that could uh, undermine the alliance. If China called partnership, they have the partnerships without alliances. That's the China's relationship with Russia. So that might undermine China's partnership with Russia. In other words, I don't think this relationship is built upon principles, but built upon purely, purely interests. Okay, well, um, I think in the interest of making sure that we get everybody fed, which is really one of our important obligations, and I know we have a very, very big uh, crowd, yes, a core interest uh, here at CSIS. So uh, we will vote. Um, and then I'll give you all the opportunity uh, to get your, uh, your lunch. But please, before we do, we're talking revisionist or reformist. The proposition is China seeks to undermine the rules-based uh, international system. Do you agree or disagree? Uh, we started out before our debate. We had 42% uh, who agreed with the proposition, 57% who disagreed with the proposition. And in uh, about 10 seconds, we're going to see whether uh, that has substantially changed. 
Um, and then we'll let you all uh, go get some lunch. Um, okay, um, let's hope, nope, has everybody voted? All right, go ahead. And wow, impressive, exactly the same as it was <laughs> before the debate. I don't know whether that's because we have two fantastic presenters who, who just argued in support of their position so effectively that everybody kept the same positions or because you're all just stubborn in your views. <laughs> but anyway, I think it was really, uh, it was an excellent panel. Um, please join me in thanking uh, Jao Sui Sheng and Professor Friedberg. I hope you'll all get your lunch and we will resume here at one o'clock for the next debate.